Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. Chapter 6 of the Life of Charles G. Finney. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Samborski. Look for me by visiting GodsResistance.com. The Life of Charles G. Finney by A.M. Hills. Revivals at Wester, Rome, Utica, Auburn, Troy, and New Lebanon. Returning from the Synod at Utica, Finney met Mr. Gale, his old teacher, who insisted that he stop and preach, or at least make him a visit. Gale had lost his health and was living in the country near the village of Western. The Presbyterian Church had no stated preaching at all and no pastor. He was in time to attend the Thursday evening prayer meeting led by one of the elders. Each elder made a long prayer, which was a mournful wail, telling the Lord how many years they had had their prayer meeting with no answer to their prayers, by implication throwing the responsibility on God for their barrenness of soul. This stirred Finney to the heart. He arose, took their confessions for a text. He says, God inspired me to give them a terrible searching. He asked them whether they had come together professedly to mock God. They all wept, confessed, and broke their hearts before God, and begged him to remain and preach on the Sabbath. On Friday, his mind was greatly exercised. He spent the day in prayer and got a mighty hold upon God. Sunday, the house was packed, and he preached, and God came down with power upon the people, and everybody realized that a revival was on them. He made an appointment to preach in different parts of the town. The startling experiences of previous revivals were repeated here, and the work swept out farther and farther until the people were attending his meetings from Rome. Rome. Reverend Moses Gallet, then a pastor there, came to hear Finney after the second visit. He said to him, Brother Finney, it seems to me that I have a new Bible. I never before understood the promises as I do now. My mind is full of the subject, and the promises are new to me. This led Finney to see that God was preparing that pastor for a great work among his people. Reverend Gallet arranged for an exchange which Finney was reluctant to grant, but he went and preached three times on Sunday. The word took immediate effect, and heads bowed before the Lord in the deepest conviction. Monday morning the pastor returned, and, by the advice of Finney, appointed an inquiry meeting without letting people know that Finney would be there. To his surprise and great agitation, he found a room packed, and the leading members and foremost young men of his congregation were there, and the feeling was so deep that there was danger of an outburst that would be almost uncontrollable. This Finney always endeavored to avoid as a thing that hindered the action of the soul. He spoke a few calm, quiet words, but the stoutest men writhed in their seats. It would not be possible, he wrote, for one who had never witnessed such a scene to realize what the force of the truth sometimes is under the power of the Holy Ghost. It was indeed a two-edged sword. The pain that it produced, when searchingly presented in a few words of conversation, would create a distress that seemed unendurable. The pastor, unaccustomed to such a sight, turned pale and said, What shall I do? What shall we do? Finney put his hand on Brother Gallet's shoulder and whispered, Keep quiet. He then, in a few words, pointed the convicted to Jesus, stopped short, and led them in prayer in a low, unimpassioned voice, but interceded with the Savior to interpose his blood then and there, and to lead all these sinners to accept the salvation which he proffered and to believe to the saving of their souls. He rose from his knees and said, Now please go home without speaking a word to each other. Try to keep silent and do not break out into any manifestation of feeling, but go to your rooms. Careful as he was, a young man fell to the floor, and several of his companions then fell around him. The people went sobbing and sighing into the street. The next morning, people were calling from every direction for Finney and the pastor to visit their families. As they went into a house, the people would rush in and fill the largest room. In some houses, they would find people kneeling and others prostrate on the floor. In the afternoon, the large dining room of the hotel was crammed to its utmost capacity. The state of things was extraordinary. Men of the strongest nerves were cut down and helpless and had to be carried home. The meeting lasted till nearly midnight, and a great number were hopefully converted. The courthouse was opened and crowded daily. Ministers rushed in from the neighboring towns and were filled with amazement at what they saw. 
nearly all the professional men and prominent citizens embraced religion. An opposer fell dead. Reverend Gallet's whole congregation were converted, and he afterward reported that in 20 days, 500 were converted in Rome. The effect of this revival was also felt in outlying settlements, in some of which all the people were converted. For months, a sunrise prayer meeting was maintained and was largely attended. Open immorality was banished. So pervasive and permanent was the influence that Mr. Gallette said it did not seem like the same place. Utica A great excitement sprung up in Utica over this work. The most prominent citizen of Rome was president of a bank in Utica. He was not a Christian. The first time he heard Finney, he told his family, That man is mad, and I should not be surprised if he set the town on fire. He would not go to the meetings, but they went on. At a meeting of the directors of the bank, one of them rallied him on the condition of things at Rome. He responded, Gentlemen, say what you will, there is something very remarkable in the state of things at Rome. Certainly no human power or eloquence has produced what we see there. I cannot understand it. You say it will soon subside. No doubt the intensity of feeling that is now in Rome will soon subside or the people will become insane. But gentlemen, there is no accounting for that state of feeling by any philosophy unless there be something divine in it. The banker was soon converted. The county sheriff came from Utica to Rome on business. He said as soon as he crossed the old canal, a strange impression came over him, an awe so deep that he could not shake it off. He felt as if God pervaded the whole atmosphere. The hostler of the hotel appeared to feel the same. He said everybody else appeared to feel just as he did. Such an awe, such a solemnity, such a state of things he had never had any conception of before. He got out of town as soon as possible, but was converted a few weeks later at Utica. The minister's wife, a sister of the famous missionary Mills, whose zeal led to the formation of the American Board of Foreign Missions, was converted. She was under awful conviction for many days until it was feared she would go insane. She finally found pardon and rushed out of her room with her face all in a glow, exclaiming, Oh, Mr. Finney, I have found the Savior. I found the Savior. Don't you think that it was the ornaments in my hair that stood in the way of my conversion? I found when I prayed they would come up before me. I was driven to desperation. I said, I will not have these things come up again. I will put them away from me forever. As soon as I had promised that, the Lord revealed himself to my soul. These marvelous occurrences were all reported in Utica. A woman in that town was also given such a burden of prayer for the ungodly in the city that she prayed for two days and nights incessantly until her strength was overcome by exhaustion, a literal travail of soul. It was God's spirit preparing the way for the coming of his servant. The pastor, Dr. Aiken, of one of the Presbyterian churches, invited Finney to preach in his church. The word took immediate effect, and the place became filled with the manifested influence of the Holy Spirit. The work spread and moved on powerfully. The sheriff was among the first to be converted. At once, a neighboring hotel where he boarded became a center of religious work. The stages stopped there, and travelers, in many instances, stopping for a meal or overnight, would get convicted and converted before leaving. Merchants from neighboring villages coming to town to trade would get mad because everybody in the stores talk religion, but they themselves would soon be in anguish of soul and bowing to God. A proud and cultured school teacher in Newburgh heard of the wonderful work in Rome and Utica and dismissed her school for two weeks to see it for herself. She got under powerful conviction and was wonderfully converted. She soon afterward married a Mr. Gulick and went with him as a missionary to the Sandwich Islands where she did a great work for Christ. The Oneida Presbytery met during the revival, and a minister on the afternoon of the closing day made a violent speech against the revival, which greatly shocked and grieved the Christians present. They gave themselves to prayer, and there was a great crying to God that he would counteract the evil influence of that speech. The next morning, the minister who made it was found dead in his bed. The Mill Scene the brother-in-law of Mr. Finney was superintendent of a cotton factory in a neighboring village now called New York Mills. Finney, by invitation, went there and preached an evening sermon in a schoolhouse. It was crowded, especially with mill operatives. The word took powerful effect. The next morning after breakfast, Finney went into the factory to look through it. He observed, as he was passing along in silence, a good deal of agitation among those who were busy at the looms and other implements of work. In one room were many young women. Finney could see that they were excitedly talking about him. One was trying to mend a broken thread, but her hand trembled so that she could not tie it. When I came within eight or ten feet of her, I looked solemnly at her. She observed it and was quite overcome, and sank down and burst into tears. 
The impression caught almost like powder, and in a few moments, all in the room were in tears. The feeling spread through the factory. The owner of the establishment was present, and, seeing the condition of things, though not a Christian, he said to the superintendent, Stop the mill and let the people attend to religion, for it is more important that our souls should be saved than that this factory should run. The factory was immediately stopped. The hands were assembled in the largest room, and Finney spoke to them. A more powerful meeting, he says, I scarcely ever attended. The revival went through the mill with astonishing power, and in a few days nearly all were converted. There were hundreds working in this mill. A young man of unusual gifts in Hamilton College, who afterwards became quite famous, Theodore Weld by name, came over to inspect the meetings, declaring it was all fanaticism and boasting to his college mates that he would not be moved. He heard Finney but once, when he met him and abused him for an hour in a most shameful manner. Finney said a few words to him about his soul and left him. That night, he spent by turns walking the floor and prostrate in agony, angry and rebellious, yet so convicted that he could hardly live. Just at daylight, a pressure came upon him that crushed him down to the floor. He finally gave his heart to God, went the next night to the meeting, and made a humble confession, and from that time became a very efficient helper, and for years was a mighty winner of souls. This revival spread from Rome and Utica as a center in all directions, as Finney circled out. Of 500 conversions in one place, there was not a case of apostasy after eight months. A pamphlet was published by a Presbyterian minister describing the revival and stating that there were 3,000 converts within the bounds of the presbytery. Probably more thorough conversions never took place under any preacher in the history of the Christian church. Finney stopped in his memoirs to tell us what he preached that God so blessedly used. It were well if all preachers would note them well. The doctrines preached in these revivals were those I always preached. Instead of telling sinners to use the means of grace and pray for a new heart, we called on them to make themselves a new heart and a new spirit and press the duty of instant surrender to God. We told them the Spirit was striving with them to induce them now to give Him their hearts, now to believe, and to enter at once upon a life of devotion to Christ, of faith and love and Christian obedience. We taught them that while they were praying for the Holy Spirit, they were constantly resisting him, and that if they would at once yield to their own convictions of duty, they would be Christians. We tried to show them that everything they did or said before they had submitted, believed, given their hearts to God, was all sin, was not that which God required them to do, but was simply deferring repentance and resisting the Holy Ghost. Such teaching as this was, of course, opposed by many. Nevertheless, it was greatly blessed by the Spirit of God. Formerly, it had been supposed necessary that a sinner should remain under conviction a long time, and it was not uncommon to hear old professors of religion say that they were under conviction many months or years before they found relief, and they evidently had the impression that the longer they were under conviction, the greater was the evidence that they were truly converted. We taught the opposite of this. I insisted that if they remained long under conviction, they were in danger of becoming self-righteous in the sense that they would think that they had prayed a great while and done a great deal to persuade God to save them, and that finally they would settle down with a false hope. We told them that under this protracted conviction, they were in danger of grieving the Spirit of God away, and when their distress of mind ceased, a reaction would naturally take place. They would feel less distress and perhaps obtain a degree of comfort from which they were in danger of inferring that they were converted, that the bare thought that they were possibly converted might create a degree of joy and peace, and that this state of mind might still further delude them by being taken as evidence that they were converted. We tried thoroughly to dispose of this false teaching. We insisted then, as I have ever done since, on immediate submission as the only thing that God could accept at their hands, and that all delay under any pretext whatever was rebellion against God. It became very common under my preaching for persons to be convicted and converted in the course of a few hours and sometimes in the course of a few minutes. Such sudden conversions were alarming to many good people, and of course, they predicted that the converts would fall away and prove not to be soundly converted. But the event proved that among those sudden conversions were some of the most influential Christians that have ever been in that region of country. This has been my experience through all my ministry. Revival at Auburn. It was in the summer of 1826, Dr. Lansing, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church at Auburn, came to Utica to witness the revival and urge Finney to go out and labor with him. He did so. He soon found that some of the professors in the theological seminary in that place were taking an attitude of hostility to the revival. We shall speak of this opposition of ministers in a chapter by itself. 
It is an interesting phase of all the progressive work in the kingdom of God. In Auburn, as in other places, God was with his faithful servant. A prominent physician, an elder in the Presbyterian church, was felled to the floor by the Holy Spirit coming upon him. A universalist bitterly opposed the work as they invariably did and forbade his wife to attend the meetings. The poor wife wrestled in prayer for her husband and he was led by the Spirit to invite her to go with him to church. Finney knew nothing of this. He had been visiting and laboring with inquirers all day and he reached the pulpit, as he often did in those days, without either sermon or text. During the introductory service, a text occurred to his mind from which he had never preached. It was the words of the man with an unclean spirit who cried out, Let us alone. God helped him to depict in a most vivid manner the conduct of sinners who wanted to be let alone and tried to keep others from God. In the midst of the discourse, the Universalist fell from his seat and cried out in such a terrific manner that all preaching was at an end. He wept aloud and confessed his sins in a way that brought tears and sobs to nearly everyone in the house. The Universalist was soon rejoicing in conscious pardon. Dr. Lansing's church members were much conformed to the world and were accused by the unconverted of being leaders in dress and fashion and worldliness. Finney, as usual, directed his preaching so as to secure the reformation of the church. One Sabbath, he preached on that line as searchingly as he was able and then called upon the pastor to pray. The pastor was so much impressed with the sermon that he supplemented the discourse with an earnest appeal to the people. Just then, a man arose in the gallery and said in a distinct tone, Mr. Lansing, I do not believe that such remarks from you can do any good while you wear a ruffled shirt and a gold ring and while your wife and the ladies of your family sit as they do before the congregation dressed as the leaders in the fashions of the day. It seemed as if this would kill Dr. Lansing outright. He cast himself over the pulpit and wept like a child. The people almost universally dropped their heads upon the seat in front of them, and many wept on every side. With the exception of the sobs and sighs, the house was profoundly silent. Dr. Lansing was a good man. He had worn ruffled shirts from childhood. His ring was very small and given him by his dying wife with the request that he would wear it for her sake. He had done so without a thought of its being a stumbling block, but he said, if these things are an offense, I will not wear them. The church had a public confession of their backsliding and want of a Christian spirit written and they stood while it was read, many of them in tears. It is needless to say that the church was revived. That revival spread to Cayuga and to Scanatelli's and to other places. Revival at Troy, Autumn of 1826 Reverend Dr. Beeman and his session invited Finney to come and labor with them in Troy. He spent the autumn and winter of 1826 in that city and vicinity. We have few incidents recorded. For Mr. Finney, in his memoirs, soon begins to tell us of the opposition of the preachers, which we will relate in the next chapter. He does tell us that the revival was powerful in that city, that the Presbytery put Dr. Beeman on trial during the revival, and he was acquitted of all charges against him, that the failure of the effort to break down Dr. Beeman considerably discomfited the outside movement to break down the revival, that Christian people continued praying mightily to God, and he, Finney, kept up preaching and praying incessantly, and the revival went on with increasing power, that Mr. S., cashier of a bank in that city, was so pressed by the spirit of prayer for the conversion of the president of the bank that when the meeting closed, he could not rise from his knees. The president was soon after converted. These incidents are of exceeding value as showing the large place which prayer held in the revivals under Finney. New Lebanon Revival A young lady from New Lebanon, Columbia County, came to Troy during the revival to purchase a dress for a ball. A cousin, lately converted, urged her to attend the meetings and hear Finney. At first, she was full of enmity of heart, but soon became deeply convicted, then thoroughly converted. She returned home not to participate in a ball, but to prepare the church for Finney to come and hold a revival. It started in her own home with her father, who was an elder of the Presbyterian Church. Most of the prominent men in the community were converted. A young man by the name of John T. Avery was converted, who afterwards became a minister and a celebrated evangelist and who labored in a church of which I was a member in my boyhood about 1860. This was in the late spring and early summer of 1827. For a little time, God had withdrawn his precious servant from the strife of tongues and the opposition that was rolling up against him and rejoiced his heart by another harvest of souls. Chapter 7 of The Life of Charles G. Finney, Ministerial Opposition and the New Lebanon Convention. The devil hates true religion and all scriptural revivals with a perfect hatred. 
He is never at a loss to find means and agencies to oppose them. One of his most subtle and satanic methods is to arouse prominent and eminent leaders in the church to oppose their brethren who are successful in winning souls. Paul's worst enemies were his own brethren, the Jews, and members of the Sanhedrin. The dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church thirsted for the blood of Luther. Men prominent in the church, to their abiding disgrace, rolled up a mighty opposition against John Wesley. The holiness preachers are opposed in the same way today by dead churches and barren preachers. Finney did not escape. It is with great sorrow that we must record things that dim the fame of two or more names honorable in the history of the American churches. When Finney went to Auburn, he was not fully aware of the amount of opposition he was destined to meet from the ministry, not the ministry in the region where he labored, but from those where he had not labored, and who knew personally nothing of him, but were influenced by the false reports which they heard. But in that center of learning he found, from various sources, that a system of espionage was being carried on that was destined to result, and intended to result, in an extensive union of ministers and churches to hedge in and prevent the spread of revivals in connection with his labors. Asahel Nettleton, the evangelist, and Dr. Lyman Beecher of Boston were the leaders in this unseemly opposition. Nettleton boasted that Finney should go no farther east than central New York. Finney said nothing to anybody publicly or privately, but gave himself incessantly to prayer. I looked to God with great earnestness, day after day, to be directed, asking him to show me the path of duty and give me grace to ride out the storm. I shall never forget what a scene I passed through one day in my room at Dr. Lansing's of Auburn. The Lord showed me, as in a vision, what was before me. He drew so near to me while I engaged in prayer that my flesh literally trembled on my bones. I shook from head to foot under a full sense of the presence of God. At first, and for some time, it seemed more like being on the top of Sinai amidst its full thunderings than in the presence of the cross of Christ. Never in my life was I so awed and humbled before God as then. Nevertheless, instead of feeling like fleeing, I seemed drawn nearer and nearer to God, to that presence that filled me with such unutterable awe and trembling. After a season of great humiliation before him, there came a great lifting up, God assured me that he would be with me and uphold me, that no opposition should prevail against me, that I had nothing to do in regard to all this matter but to keep about my work and wait for the salvation of God. The sense of God's presence and all that passed between my soul and God at that time I can never describe. It led me to be perfectly trustful, perfectly calm, and to have nothing but the most kindly feelings toward all the brethren that were misled and were arraying themselves against me. I felt assured that all would come out right, that my true course was to leave everything to God and to keep about my work, and as the storm gathered and the opposition increased, I never for one moment doubted how it would result. I was never disturbed by it. I never spent a waking hour in thinking about it, when to all outward appearances it seemed as if all the churches of the land, except where I had labored, would unite to shut me out of their pulpits. This was the avowed determination, as I understood, of the men that led in the opposition. They were so deceived that they thought there was no effectual way but to unite, and as they expressed it, put him down. But God assured me that they could not put me down. The Lord did not allow me to lay the opposition to heart, and I can truly say, so far as I can recollect, I never had an unkind feeling toward Mr. Nettleton or Dr. Beecher or any leading opposer of the work during the whole of their opposition. It seems that Rev. William R. Weeks, an extreme Calvinist of a community where Finney labored, opposed him on theological grounds. He held that both sin and holiness were produced in the mind by a direct act of almighty power, that God made men sinners or holy at his sovereign discretion, but in both cases by a direct act of almighty power, an act as irresistible as that of creation itself, that in fact God was the only proper agent in the universe, and that all creatures acted only as they were moved and compelled to act by his irresistible power. 
that every sin in the universe, both of men and of devils, was the result of a direct, irresistible act on the part of God. Such an insane theology is certainly a blasphemous libel on God. Of course, a man holding such doctrines, and the philosophy and methods that would naturally follow, would be led to oppose Finney. He, and others like him, wrote letters abroad, misrepresenting the work and poisoning the minds of prominent leaders in Massachusetts and Connecticut. A great cry and excitement was raised against new measures. He wrote a pamphlet, and so also did a Unitarian. Evil reports spread far and near, until at last, in the summer of 1827, a convention was called to meet at New Lebanon to inquire into the nature and evils of the late revivals in central New York. Finney was there, and the pastors with whom he had labored. The clergymen present from the East were Dr. Lyman Beecher, then the leading revival pastor of Boston and Massachusetts, Dr. Herman Humphrey, president of Amherst College, Dr. Justin Edwards of Andover, Massachusetts, Caleb J. Tenney of Wethersfield, and Dr. Joel Halls of Hartford, Connecticut. Upon Dr. Beecher and Asahel Nettleton was thrown the responsibility of endeavoring to check the evils that were supposed to be fostered by Finney's work. Two Lives of Finney and the Memoir of Nettleton are before me. I may be wrong, but I cannot help feeling that Nettleton was moved by jealousy of the rising fame and unparalleled success of Finney to a greater extent than he himself realized. He was nine years older than Finney, at this time 44 years old. He had been, up to Finney's advent, the most successful evangelist the East, or for that matter, the country had produced. Dr. Beecher wrote of him in 1827, Mr. Nettleton has served God and his generation with more self-denial and constancy and wisdom and success than any man living. Considering the extent of his influence, I regard him as beyond comparison the greatest benefactor which God has given to this nation. And, through his influence in promoting pure and powerful revivals of religion, as destined to be one of the greatest benefactors of the world. He had certainly made a good name for himself in Zion, but at the age of 42 to 44, he began to be agitated and excited over exaggerated and hostile and untruthful reports of the revivals under Finney. He fell utterly into Satan's trap and went so far in bitter opposition to Finney that God seemed to set him aside. His biography shows only 400 conversions in the next 10 years. He never recovered himself. Dr. Beecher sent Nettleton to Albany in the autumn of 1826 to hold a meeting and make a stand against the revivals under Finney and keep them from spreading. They might as well have tried to sweep back the ocean tides with a broom, for God was with him. Finney had the profoundest esteem and confidence in Nettleton, a real reverence for him as an honored servant of God. He had such a longing desire to see him and learn by sitting at his feet that he often dreamed of visiting him. Finney went to Albany and had an interview with him and talked briefly on theology. When Finney told him that he intended to remain in Albany and hear him preach in the evening, he manifested great uneasiness and remarked that he must not be seen with him. So Finney went and sat in the gallery with the judge and saw enough to satisfy him that he could expect no advice or instruction from Nettleton. It was plain that Nettleton was unwilling to be in his company and was holding him at arm's length and would not say anything to him with regard to revivals. The author of Memoir of Nettleton on page 238 represents him as having two interviews with Finney and expostulating with him about his calamitous measures and trying to reform him so that they could cooperate together. This is manifestly incorrect in every particular. Nettleton saw Finney but once, did not mention revival work, and was so far from wanting to cooperate with him that he would not be seen in his company. It is a sad comment on the life of a good man and shows how guarded and careful even the leaders in Israel need to be. Thomas W. Seward, Esquire, in an address upon the history of the city of Utica, said of the revival under Finney, the scene in the church was solemn beyond description. No accessories to heighten the interest or deepen the impression were ever employed. 
beyond some unaffected yet striking peculiarities of voice and manner in the speaker, there was nothing to attract curiosity or to offend the most fastidious or carping sense of propriety. It is an inadequate tribute of praise to say of his preaching that whether it was distinguished most for intellectual subtlety, strong denunciation of sin, or fearful portrayal of the wrath to come, it had its reward in uncounted accessions to the Christian ranks and renewed vigor of religious life. As a pulpit orator, his place among the foremost of his time was long ago assured. C. G. Finney, by Wright, page 60. Reverend Mr. Cross says of Finney's preaching in his community, His style was dignified, his manner urbane, his spirit childlike. The transforming effect of the revival was marked, and so deeply was the place penetrated by religious feeling that it was impossible for six years to organize a dancing party, and it was unprofitable to have a circus. C. G. Finney, by Wright, page 61. Dr. Charles P. Bush, in his Reminiscences of Finney, says that the whole character of the city of Rochester was changed by the preaching of Finney, and the elevated moral tone was felt for forty years. Yet such a beloved and efficient servant of God had practically to be put on trial by his brethren for calamitous measures. Thus his master was tried before him. From the various accounts of this convention before me, it is manifest that Beecher and Nettleton came to the convention committed against the revivals, and felt that their reputation was at stake, and that they must be justified in their opposition to Finney by the convention. When the question was raised about the sources of their information, Dr. Beecher replied, We have not come here to be catechized, and our spiritual dignity forbids us to answer any such questions. When the question came up as to the truth of the wild reports about the revivals, Dr. Beecher and Mr. Nettleton took the position that the testimony of Finney and all the ministers who had labored with him was not to be received, because they were the objects of the censure, and it would be testifying in their own case. They were not admissible as witnesses, and the facts should not be received from them. Dr. Humphrey very firmly remarked that they were the very actors in the case, and knew what they had done, and their statements were to be received by the convention without hesitation. To this, all agreed but Beecher and Nettleton. The convention sat for several days, and as the facts came out in regard to the revivals, Mr. Nettleton became so agitated and nervous that he was unable to attend several of the sessions. He plainly saw that he was losing ground and that nothing could be ascertained that could justify the course that he was taking. Dr. Beecher also felt it keenly. All the brethren declared that the evil reports circulated about the revivals were untrue, so far as Finney was concerned. But their report was not believed by Dr. Beecher. In a letter to Dr. Taylor of New Haven, he wrote that the spirit of lying was so predominant in those revivals that the brethren engaged in them could not be at all believed. Memoirs of Finney, page 191. In Beecher's biography, volume 2, page 101, he is represented as saying to Finney at the convention, Finney, I know your plan, and you know I do. You mean to come to Connecticut and carry a streak of fire to Boston. But if you attempt it, as the Lord liveth, I'll meet you at the state line and call out the artillerymen and fight every inch of the way to Boston, and then I'll fight you there. We make this brief comment on this brave threat, that in a little time Finney was in Boston preaching in Beecher's church. The reader, doubtless by this time, is curious to know what were these new measures, these calamitous measures, about which some of the leaders in Zion had worked themselves up into such a heat. Here they are, as copied from the memoir of Nettleton. Connected with this excitement, various measures were introduced, similar to those which, in former times, had been the great instrument of marring the purity of revivals and promoting fanaticism, such as praying for persons by name, encouraging females to pray and exhort in promiscuous assemblies calling upon persons to come up to the anxious seat or to rise up in the public assembly to signify that they had given their hearts to God or had made up their mind to attend to religion. To us of today, all this sounds like an invention of fiction, an idle dream of what might have been in the past. During our college vacation this summer, 1901, I did revival work in five states, Texas, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts. 
and I saw all these things done in each state, and no one protested or thought of making objections. Here in Texas Holiness University, Greenville, Texas, in whose chapel I am writing these lines, December 20th, 1901, we see all these things constantly. We have had 77 persons saved or sanctified at our altars since September 24th, and 173 since January 1st of this year. And if genuine Christian characters are made anywhere, they are being made here. Such a worked up excitement over such things that God has so used and blessed reminds me of the phrase, much ado about nothing. Yet it was once a painful fact and living history, but it did not stop the work of Finney or check it for an hour. We shall see that God gave him more power and a wider sweep of influence than ever before, while Mr. Nettleton was set aside and Dr. Beecher was utterly impotent to hurt the work. He afterward went from Boston to be the president of Lane Theological Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio. I once visited that seminary and was there shown Dr. Beecher's lecture room and the very chair in which he used to sit, back of which on the wall was his portrait. But, said the professor who was showing me around, we now quote Finney oftener than we do Beecher in these lecture rooms. Finney wrote, As I have labored extensively in this country and in Great Britain, and no exceptions have been taken to my measures, it has been assumed and asserted that since the opposition made by Mr. Nettleton and Dr. Beecher, I have been reformed and have given up the measures they complained of. This is an entire mistake. I have always and everywhere used all the measures I used in those revivals, and I have often added other measures whenever I have deemed it expedient. I have never seen the necessity of reformation in this respect. Were I to live my life over again, I think that, with the experience of more than forty years in revival labors, I should, under the same circumstances, use substantially the same measures that I did then. And let me not be understood to take credit to myself. No, indeed. It was no wisdom of my own that directed me. I was made to feel my ignorance and dependence, and led to look continually to God for His guidance. I had no doubt then, nor have I ever had, that God led me by His Spirit to take the course I did. So clearly did he lead me from day to day that I never did or could doubt that I was divinely directed. That the brethren who opposed those revivals were good men, I do not doubt. That they were misled and most grossly and injuriously deceived, I have just as little doubt. If they died under the belief that they had just reasons for what they did, and wrote and said, and that they corrected the evils of which they complained, they died grossly deceived in this respect. It is not for the safety of the church, the honor of revivals, or the glory of Christ that posterity should believe that those evils existed and were corrected by such a spirit and in such a manner as has been represented. I should have remained silent had not so marked an effort been made to perpetuate and confirm the delusion that the opposition to those revivals was justifiable and successful. I have no doubt that Dr. Beecher was led by somebody to believe that his opposition was called for. Had not Dr. Beecher's biography reopened the subject with the manifest design to justify the course that he took and rivet the impression upon the public mind that in making that opposition to those revivals he performed a great and good work, I should not feel called upon to say what I cannot now be justified in withholding. In reading his biography, I stand amazed in view of the suspicions and delusions under which his mind was laboring. I was as ignorant as a child of all this management revealed in the biography. I shared none of the terrors and distractions that seemed to have so much distressed Dr. Beecher and Mr. Nettleton. The truthful record of my labors up to the time of the convention, and from that time onward, will show how little I knew or cared what Dr. Beecher and Mr. Nettleton were saying or doing about me. I bless the Lord that I was kept from being diverted from my work by their opposition and that I never gave myself any uneasiness about it. At Auburn, God had given me the assurance that he would overrule all opposition without my turning aside to answer my opposers. This I never forgot. Under this divine assurance, I went forward with a single eye and a trustful spirit. And now, when I read what agitations, suspicions, and misapprehensions possess the minds of these brethren, I stand amazed at their delusion and consequent anxiety respecting myself and my labors. At the very time that Dr. Beecher was in Philadelphia in 1828, 
managing with members of the General Assembly, as related in his biography, I was laboring in that city and had been for several months in different churches, in the midst of a powerful revival of religion, perfectly ignorant of Dr. Beecher's errand there. I cannot be too thankful that God kept me from being agitated and changed in my spirit or views of labor by all the opposition of those days. Memoirs of Finney, Chapter 16 Chapter 8 of the Life of Charles G. Finney Revivals at Steventown, Wilmington, Philadelphia, and Reading, 1827-1830 A young lady from Steventown came to New Lebanon after the convention and heard Finney preach. She was so impressed that she invited him to come to her place and preach. Finney told her his hands were full and he thought he could not. Her utterance was choked with deep feeling, and Finney's mind became stirred profoundly over the condition of things in the place. It seems that the only church in the place was an endowed Presbyterian church that had been ministered to for many years by a minister until the church was run down entirely and the minister himself had become an infidel. The only unmarried person in the church was the young lady who invited Finney to preach. Nearly the whole town was in a state of impenitence. Most of the people lived scattered along a street nearly five miles long, and there was not a religious family on the street, nor a single house in which family prayer was maintained. Finney made an appointment to preach the next Sunday afternoon. Here occurred one of the characteristic incidences of which Finney's life was so full. He asked the person who was to take him in his carriage, Have you a steady horse? Oh, yes, he replied, perfectly so. What made you ask the question? Because, said Finney, if the Lord wants me to go to Steventown, the devil will prevent it if he can, and if you have not a steady horse, he will try to make him kill me. Strange to say, the horse ran away twice, a thing he had never done before, and came near killing them. The people were solemn and attentive. Miss S. spent the whole of the following night in prayer. The spirit of prayer also came powerfully upon Finney. It spread so much and was so answered that soon the word would cut the strongest men down and render them entirely helpless. On the evening of the day of the state election, one of the men who sat at the table to receive votes all day was so overcome by conviction that he could not leave his seat. In another pew was another man in the same condition. The infidel preacher mightily opposed the work, and God struck him down, so that during the revival he died a horrible death. It broke the spell of his influence, and there was a great turning to the Lord— there was one family of sixteen and another of seventeen, all of whom were converted. The revival was characterized by a mighty spirit of prevailing prayer, overwhelming conviction of sin, sudden and powerful conversions to Christ, great love and abounding joy of the converts, and their great earnestness, activity, and usefulness in their prayers and labors for others. Nearly all the inhabitants of the town were gathered into the church, and the town was morally renovated. Chapter 17 of Memoirs Wilmington A Reverend Mr. Gilbert of Wilmington, Delaware, visited his father in New Lebanon while Finney was preaching there, and heard him. He earnestly invited him to Wilmington. Mr. Gilbert had the old Calvinistic doctrines, and he had trained his people until they were afraid to do anything for a revival, lest they should take the work out of the hands of God. Their theory was that God would convert sinners in his own time, and that, therefore, to urge them to immediate repentance, and, in short, to attempt to promote a revival, was to attempt to make men Christians by human agency and human strength, and thus to dishonor God by taking the work out of his hands. With his usual courage, Finney took for his text, Make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die? 
He showed what a new heart was and the sinner's responsibility to have one. He preached for two hours. The house was packed. The audience was amazed at this new gospel. Some laughed, some wept, some were angry. But so spellbound were they held that they rose to their feet and stood in all parts of the house. He writes, I endeavored to show that if a man was as helpless as their views represented him to be, he is not to blame for his sins. If he had lost in Adam all power of obedience, so that obedience had become impossible to him, and that not by his own act or consent, but by the act of Adam, it was mere nonsense to say that he could be blamed for what he could not help. I endeavored also to show that in that case the atonement was no grace, but really a debt due to mankind on the part of God for having placed them in a condition so deplorable and so unfortunate. Indeed, the Lord helped me to show up with irresistible clearness the peculiar dogmas of old schoolism, Calvinism, and their inevitable results. The pastor himself accepted the truth of the sermon, and going out of the church said to a parishioner, I am sorry to say I have never preached the gospel. From that day the work went forward, and the pastor and his people got where they could wisely labor to win souls. Philadelphia, 1828-1830 to 1830. In the meantime, Dr. Patterson, a Presbyterian pastor of Philadelphia, invited Finney to preach in his church. It led to his alternating every other night between Wilmington and Philadelphia, going back and forth daily by boat. The word took such effect in Philadelphia that soon it was evident to Finney that he must give his whole time to that city. One day, Mr. Patterson said to him, Brother Finney, if the Presbyterian ministers in this city find out your views and what you are preaching to the people, they will hunt you out of the city as they would a wolf. He replied, I cannot help it. I can preach no other doctrine, and if they must drive me out of the city, let them do it and take the responsibility. But I do not believe that they can get me out. He says, I did not preach in a controversial way, but simply employed the truth in my instruction to saints and sinners, in a way so natural as not perhaps to excite very much attention, except from discriminating theologians. One night he preached on this text, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. From this he preached the nature and the universality of the atonement, and the sermon attracted so much attention and excited such an interest that by request he preached seven different evenings in succession in as many different churches. He preached for months in all the Presbyterian churches in the city but one, with such gracious results that he was urged to take a central position in the city. A German church, seating 3,000, the largest audience room in the city, was secured, and there he preached for months. It seemed, from the memoirs, that he preached in this city not far from two years. In the spring of 1829, the lumbermen came down the Delaware with their rafts from the lumber regions up the river. Many of them, reaching the city, heard of the revival, attended Finney's meetings, got converted, and went back to the lumber camps and told the story of salvation. And people turned to Christ in vast numbers. In 1831, three men from that region visited Finney and Auburn to inquire how they could get ministers to go in there. They said that the revival had extended along the river for 80 miles, and there was not a single minister of the gospel there, and not less than 5,000 people were converted in that lumber region. Finney tells an incident or two that occurred in Philadelphia, which I am moved to mention briefly. Among those who opposed his meetings was a German skeptic. His wife had come to the meetings and was thoroughly converted. He was a man of athletic frame and great fixedness of purpose. When he learned that his wife had become a Christian, 
He forbade her coming to the meetings. She asked Finney about it. He told her to avoid giving offense as much as she innocently could, but in no case to admit her duty to God for the sake of complying with his wishes, and that, as he was an infidel, she could not safely follow his advice. She went to meeting again, and he threatened to kill her. She thought it was only a vain threat and went again. When she returned, he was in a great rage, locked the door, drew out a dagger, and swore he would kill her. She fled upstairs. He caught a light to follow her, which the servant blew out. In the darkness, she got down by the back stairs into the cellar and out of the cellar window and passed the night with a friend. Thinking his rage would be over in the morning, she returned early. She found the house was in great disorder. He had broken up the furniture in his insane rage. As she entered the house, he pursued her again through the house with a drawn dagger. It was daylight, and she could not escape him. As she reached the last room, she turned to face him, fell upon her knees, and cried to God for help. At this point, God arrested him. He glared at her for a moment, dropped his dagger, and fell upon the floor and cried for mercy himself. He confessed his sins to God and to her and begged both to forgive him. From that moment, he was a wonderfully changed man and became one of the most earnest of Christian converts and became greatly attached to Finney, who received him and his wife into the church and baptized their children. Finney tells also of a minister's daughter who had been trained in Calvinism by her father from childhood and led to think that if she was one of the elect, she would be converted in due time, and that until she was converted and her nature changed by the Spirit of God, she could do nothing for herself but to read the Bible and pray for a new heart. She became greatly convicted but took her father's advice and waited for God to do his sovereign work. She promised God that she would never marry till she was a Christian, supposing that God would soon convert her. When eighteen years of age, she became engaged to a noble young man, but deferred marriage, according to her vow, until she was converted. She thus kept him waiting five years, until he was thrown from a carriage and suddenly killed. This aroused the enmity of her heart against God, and she accused him of dealing hardly with her. In his preaching stripped all these refuges of lies away from her. She saw that her father's teachings had been wrong, and that she should have given her heart to God long ago, and that she herself, and not God, was entirely to blame. The thought of her blasphemous attitude toward God and in blaming him as she had done threw her into despair. Out of this state of mind, Finney had to lead her when she became a most humble, submissive, and beautiful convert. Memoirs, Chapter 18 Here the great evangelist in his memoirs pays his respects to the Calvinistic theology of Princeton in the following words. As I found myself in Philadelphia in the heart of the Presbyterian Church, and where Princeton views were almost universally embraced, I must say still more emphatically than I have done, if possible, that the greatest difficulty I met in promoting revivals of religion was the false instruction given to the people, and especially to inquiring sinners. Indeed, in all my ministerial life, in every place and country where I have labored, I have found this difficulty to a greater or lesser extent, and I am satisfied that multitudes are living in sin who would immediately be converted if they were truly instructed. The foundation of error of which I speak is the dogma that human nature is sinful in itself, and that therefore sinners are entirely unable to become Christians. It is admitted, either expressly or virtually, that sinners may want to be Christians, and that they really do want to be Christians, and often try to be Christians, and yet somehow fail. It has been the practice, and still is to some extent, when ministers were preaching repentance and urging people to repent, 
to save their orthodoxy by telling them that they could not repent any more than they could make a world. But the sinner must be set to do something, and with all their orthodoxy they could not bear to tell him that he had nothing to do. They must therefore set himself righteously to pray for a new heart. They would sometimes tell him to do his duty, to press forward in duty, to read his Bible, to use the means of grace. In short, they would tell him to do anything and everything but the very thing which God commands him to do. God commands him to repent now, to believe now, to make to him a new heart now. But they were afraid to urge God's claims in this form, because they were continually telling the sinner that he had no ability whatever to do these things. Here he tells what he heard a good minister preach in England. His text was, Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. He made four points. 1. Repentance is an involuntary change, a mere state of the sensibility, feeling bad over sin. Number 2. It is the sinner's duty to repent. Number 3. Although God requires it of them, they could not repent, and God knew it was impossible for them to repent only as he gave them repentance. Number four, you ask then what you shall do. Go home and pray for repentance. If it does not come, keep praying until it does come. Finney says, I actually found it difficult to keep from screaming to the people to repent and not to think that they were doing their duty in merely praying for repentance. Such instruction always pained me exceedingly and much of my labor in the ministry is consisted of correcting those views and impressing the sinner immediately to do just what God commands him to do. When the sinner has asked me if the Spirit of God has nothing to do with it, I have said, Yes, as a matter of fact, you will not do it of yourself, but the Spirit of God is now striving with you to lead you to do just what he would have you do. He is striving to lead you to repentance, to lead you to believe, and is striving with you not to secure the performance of mere outward acts, but to change your heart. The church, to a very great extent, has instructed sinners to begin on the outside in religion to secure an inward change. I have ever treated this as totally wrong and in the highest degree dangerous. I think I may say I have found thousands of sinners of all ages who are living under this delusion and, and would never think themselves called upon to do anything more than merely to pray for a new heart, live a moral life, read their Bibles, attend meetings, use the means of grace, and leave all the responsibility of their conversion and salvation with God. I cannot but feel with Finney that these characteristics, teachings of Calvinism, have sent thousands of people to hell. We shall have some specimen cases very soon in these pages. Revival at Reading, early part of 1830. Finney went from Philadelphia to Reading. There were several German churches and one Presbyterian church, whose pastor, Dr. Greer, secured the help of Finney. One of the elders of the church was manager of a series of balls that was to extend through the winter. Finney told the pastor that those balls would soon be given up, or he would be shut out of the pulpit. He preached several days and then appointed a meeting for those only who were anxious for salvation and had made up their minds to attend to the subject at once. The lecture room, nearly as large as the body of the church above, was filled. Finney stripped away their misapprehensions and mistakes that they must simply use means and wait for God to convert them. He then called upon all who were willing, then and there, to pledge themselves to give up all sin and renounce it forever, and live wholly to God and who were willing to commit themselves to the sovereign mercy of God in Christ Jesus, to kneel down and do what God required of them. They knelt in vast numbers, people of all classes, rich and poor, high and low, 
The stillness of death came upon them, broken only by sobs and sighs and weeping, while Finney prayed. Early one morning, an able lawyer visited Finney, deeply concerned for salvation. He informed Finney that when he was a student at Princeton College, he and two of his classmates, under deep conviction, went to Dr. Ashbel Green, president of the college, and asked him what they should do to be saved. The doctor told them to read their Bible and to pray God to give them a new heart and to press forward, and the Spirit of God will convert you, or else he will leave you, and you will return back to your sins again. Well, asked Finney, how did it terminate? Oh, he replied, we did just as he told us to do, until we lost all interest in the subject. Then, bursting into tears, he said, My two companions are in drunkard's graves, and if I cannot repent, I shall soon be in one myself. Finney showed him that God could not do for him what he required him to do. God required him to repent, but could not repent for him, required him to believe, but could not believe for him, God required him to submit, but could not submit for him. He then showed him the agency that the Spirit of God has in giving the sinner repentance and a new heart, that it is a divine persuasion, that the Spirit leads him to see his sins, urges him to give them up, and to flee from the wrath to come. He presents to him the Savior, the Atonement, the plan of salvation, and urges him to accept it. He soon knelt down and gave his heart to God, and then said, Oh, if Dr. Green had only told us this that you've told me, we should have all been converted immediately. But my friends are lost, and what a wonder of mercy it is that I am saved. One night a wicked man was so convicted under the preaching that he went home and got in such agony that his family thought he would die, and dispatched a messenger for Finney in the face of a terrific storm. He could hear the man fairly howling in agony before he got near the house. When I entered, I found him sitting on the floor, his wife supporting his head, and what a look on his face. Accustomed as I was to seeing people under great conviction, his appearance gave me a tremendous shock. It was indescribable. He was writhing in agony, grinding his teeth, and literally gnawing his tongue for pain. He cried out to me, Oh, Mr. Finney, I am lost. I am a lost soul. I was greatly shocked and exclaimed, If this is conviction, what is hell? But I soon led his thoughts to the way of salvation, pressed the Savior upon his attention and upon his acceptance, and he found peace. The elder who was managing the ball was converted, and his whole family, and the vast congregation. A distiller was converted, and ordered his distillery torn down. The German pastors very generally opposed the revival. One of them told Mr. Finney that he had made 1,600 Christians in that city by baptism and giving them the communion. That was their only conception of religion. It was held that, for people to begin to think of becoming religious by being converted and to establish family prayer or to give themselves to secret prayer, was not only fanaticism, but was virtually saying that their ancestors had all gone to hell, for they had done no such thing. Some of their people got converted, but the pastors spoke very severely of those that forsook the way of their fathers and thought it necessary to be converted and to maintain family and secret prayer. How fallen the German church is, a church of form and ceremony without vital piety. Lancaster, Spring of 1830 From Reading, Finney went to Lancaster and remained a short time. The interest increased from day to day, and hopeful conversions multiplied. One night he urged the audience to immediate decision and asked all to rise who would then and there accept Christ. He even pressed the thought upon them that 
In an audience so large, it might be the last opportunity some would ever have to decide the question, and that they would then decide their everlasting destiny one way or the other. God would hold them to their decision. Many rose to their feet and decided for God in heaven. Two men sat near the door, deeply agitated, but did not rise. On their way home, they discussed the matter, one of them confessing that he was deeply moved over the fact that it might be the final opportunity. They soon separated at a corner. It was a very dark night. The man, so deeply moved by the Holy Spirit, walked but a little way when he fell over the curbstone and broke his neck. Called, but lost. Chapter 9 of The Life of Charles G. Finney Revivals in Columbia, New York City, Rochester, Auburn, Buffalo, Providence, and Boston. 1830-1832 In midsummer of 1830, Finney was urged to hold meetings in Columbia, New York. There was a large German church there, only about ten of whom knew what it was to have a change of heart. The young pastor had studied theology under a German doctor of divinity. One of his fellow students was religiously inclined and used to pray in his closet. Their teacher suspected this and in some way came to a knowledge of the fact. He warned the young man against it as a very dangerous practice and said he would become insane if he persisted in it. And he should be blamed himself for allowing a student to take such a course. Mr. H., the young pastor, said that until recently he had had no religion. He had joined the church in the common way of baptism and confirmation, and had no thought that anything else was requisite, so far as piety was concerned, to become a minister. But he had a pious mother who knew better, and was greatly distressed that a son of hers should enter the sacred ministry who had never been converted. Her prayers and influence brought him to conviction and conversion. Then his wife was converted. He then sent for Finney and listened to his preaching with almost irrepressible joy. The congregation turned to God with one accord, and the revival spread until it reached and converted nearly all the inhabitants of the town. Galesburg in Illinois was settled by a colony from Columbia, who were nearly all converts of this revival. The founder of the colony and of Knox College, located there, was Mr. Gale, Mr. Finney's theological teacher. New York City Anson G. Phelps of New York City, since widely known for his great benevolent gifts, hearing that Finney had not been invited to the pulpits of the city, hired a vacant church in Vanderwater Street, and sent an urgent request to Finney to come and preach there. He went, and preached with such power and success, that before three months elapsed, Mr. Phelps bought a church in Prince Street near Broadway, and there Finney preached nearly every night for a year to crowded houses. Prominent lawyers and leading businessmen and vast numbers of people found God. A church was formed having free pews, out of the converts who had no relation with any other churches. Long before the year was ended, many ministers in the city would have been glad to have Finney labor in their churches. Mr. Arthur Tappan, the philanthropist, formed a friendship with Finney while in New York that was lifelong. His brother Lewis lived in Boston and was a Unitarian. He had read in Unitarian papers that Finney was a half-crazed fanatic who had declared himself to be the Brigadier General of Jesus Christ. This and like reports were quoted by Lewis, who insisted on their truth, and offered to bet his brother Arthur five hundred dollars that he could prove them to be true. Arthur replied, Lewis, you know I do not bet, but if you can prove by credible testimony that the reports about Finney are true, I will give you five hundred dollars. I make this offer to lead you to investigate. I want you to know that these stories are utterly unreliable. Lewis Tappan wrote to a Unitarian minister in Trenton Falls, New York, 
and authorized him to expend $500, if need be, to collect such testimony as would stand in a court of justice. After months of the most diligent and painstaking search, the effort proved a total failure. It led to Lewis Tappan's conviction, conversion, and change from Unitarianism to the Orthodox faith. All his remaining life, he too was a devoted friend of Finney. Rochester, 1831 Leaving New York City in the summer of 1831 for a little rest with Mrs. Finney's parents, he was urged to labor in the Third Presbyterian Church of Rochester, whose pulpit was vacant. There was a considerable division at the time in the church and among the churches, making Rochester, at the time, anything but a hopeful field. Finney and his wife packed their trunks and called the saints of Utica together to pray for divine guidance as to the choice of field in which he should labor. Many were open. Rochester was the least inviting of them all. The brethren were unanimous in the opinion that Rochester could not be named in comparison with New York or Philadelphia as a hopeful field. This also was Finney's conviction, and they parted in the evening, he fully expecting to take the boat in the morning for New York. But before he retired to rest, when alone with God, he was impressed that it was God's leading to go to Rochester. In the morning the packet boat came along, and they embarked, and went westward instead of eastward. Very soon the Christians began to unite. The wife of a prominent lawyer, a lady of high standing, culture, and extensive influence, was one of the first converts. She had been a gay worldly woman, very fond of society, and deeply regretted the coming of Finney, as she was afraid that there would be a revival that would interfere with the pleasures of the coming winter. Her remarkable conversion produced much excitement among the class of people to which she belonged. The Anxious Seat I had never, wrote Finney, except in rare instances until I went to Rochester, used as a means of promoting revivals what has since been called the Anxious Seat. I had sometimes asked persons in the congregation to stand up, but this I had not frequently done. However, in studying upon the subject, I had felt the necessity for some measure that would bring sinners to a stand. From my own experience and observation, I found that, with the higher classes especially, the greatest obstacle to be overcome was their fear of being known as anxious inquirers. They were too proud to take any position that would reveal them to others as anxious for their souls. I had found also that something was needed to make the impression on them, that they were expected at once to give up their hearts, something that would call them to act, and act as publicly before the world as they had in their sins, something that would commit them publicly to the service of Christ. When I had called them simply to stand up in the public congregation, I found that this had a very good effect and, so far as it went, it answered the purpose for which it was intended. But, after all, I had felt for some time that something was necessary to bring them out from among the mass of the ungodly to a public renunciation of their evil ways and a public committal of themselves to God. At Rochester I first introduced this measure. A few days after the conversion of the prominent lady above referred to, he made such a call upon all who were willing to renounce their sins and give themselves to God to come forward to certain seats, which he requested be vacated, and offer themselves up to God while he made them subjects of prayer. A great number came, among them some very prominent people. It was soon seen that the Lord was aiming at the highest classes of society. My meetings soon became thronged with that class. The lawyers, physicians, merchants, and indeed all the most intelligent people became more and more interested and more and more easily influenced. A large number of lawyers, nearly all the judges, bankers, merchants, master mechanics, and leading men and women of the city were converted. The spirit of prayer in this revival was wonderful. The spirit of prayer was poured out so powerfully 
that some persons stayed away from public services to pray, being unable to restrain their feelings under preaching. A Mr. Abel Clary was converted in the same revival with Finney, and had been licensed to preach. But his spirit of prayer was such he was so burdened with the souls of men that he was not able to preach much, his whole time and strength being given to prayer. The burden of his soul would frequently be so great that he was unable to stand, and he would writhe and groan in agony. He was at Rochester some days praying for Finney before Finney knew he was there. The man with whom he lived said to Finney, He cannot go to the meetings. He prays nearly all the time, night and day, and in such an agony of mind that I do not know what to make of it. Sometimes he cannot even stand on his knees and will lie prostrate on the floor and groan and pray in a manner that quite astonishes me. Father Nash and three deacons were also in much the same manner, giving themselves up to prayer for Finney. Finney's mighty preaching and all this prevailing prayer God blessed in a wonderful way. Ministers and prominent people came into Rochester from neighboring towns and cities, and even from other states to see this mighty work of God, and went away carrying the revival fire with them. The work spread like waves in every direction. Finney would sally out in neighboring town and cities and preach a few days, keeping Rochester as the center. Twelve hundred joined the Presbyterian churches in the neighborhood, besides the vast numbers that joined other churches. But the greatness of the work was such that it attracted the attention of ministers and Christians in New England and other states, and the very fame of it was an efficient instrument in the hands of God of promoting the greatest revival of religion this country has ever witnessed. Dr. Beecher said of it, that was the greatest work of God and the greatest revival of religion that the world has ever seen in so short a time. One hundred thousand were reported as having connected themselves with churches as the result of that great revival. This is unparalleled in the history of the church and of the progress of religion. In no year during the Christian era had we any account of so great a revival of religion. The opposition to Finney's work greatly subsided after the New Lebanon Convention, and grew less and less. At Rochester, he felt none of it. Ministers and even the most ungodly sinners became convinced that the work was of God. He addressed the public school, and a great number of the pupils turned to God. It afterward was found that more than forty of them became ministers. The only theater in the city was converted to a livery stable. Revival in Auburn Finney labored at Rochester six months. He was invited by Dr. Knott, president of Union College at Schenectady, to go and labor with his students. Finney was so worn out with excessive revival labors that people thought he would die with consumption. But he started for Schenectady. The roads were so bad and riding on the stage was so wearisome that he stopped in Auburn to rest. It became known that he was in the place, and a large petition was drawn up and signed by a large number of influential men, the very people who in 1826 had opposed his work, begging him to overlook their former opposition and beseeching him to stop and preach the gospel to them. Finney felt that it was a call of God and agreed to stay and preach four times a week, all he dared to do with his precarious health. The second Sabbath he saw the solemn face of Abel Clary in the audience. He had come to pray for him, and did pray with the same mighty groaning of spirit that characterized his wrestling prayer in Rochester. One of the first men to the anxious seat was the leader of the opposition five years previous. Nearly or quite every person who signed the petition was converted, and in all five hundred persons. Buffalo. From Auburn he went to Buffalo. The work there, as at Auburn and Rochester, took effect very generally among the leading classes. Reverend Dr. Lord, then a lawyer, was one of the converts. One of the wealthiest men in the city greatly opposed him, virulently denying his position, that the sinners cannot is simply a will not.
that the only difficulty to be overcome was the voluntary wickedness of sinners, and that they were wholly unwilling to be Christians. This rich man greatly rebelled against such teaching, and insisted that it was false in his case, for he was conscious of being willing to be a Christian, but God did not make him one. This man afterward was mightily convicted and tried to pray, but found that he could not pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. He then realized that he was at heart opposed to God, and did not want and had never been willing to have Jesus reign over him. He finally turned to God with all his heart, acknowledged Finney to be right, and afterward gladly cooperated with him. From there, Finney went in the autumn to Providence. The work of grace began at once and went forward in a most interesting manner. But for some reason not given, his stay of three weeks was too brief to secure such gracious results as he had witnessed in other places. At that time, in this country, denominational lines were very tightly drawn, and the churches of all denominations did not unite and invite an evangelist to come and work in the city, as was done during the career of Moody. The age was not ripe for such movements. When Finney went to a city, he usually had to fight his way against bigotry, sectarianism, and denominational jealousy, as well as Calvinistic theology and ritualism, Unitarianism, Universalism, and the devil. There were, however, many interesting cases of conversion, and several of the men converted became lifelong leaders of the Christian work in the city. Among other converts was the most notoriously beautiful young woman in the place. She finally became so deeply convicted that she came to Finney of her own accord and confessed to him, Had it not been for my pride and regard for my reputation, I should have been as wicked a girl as there is in Providence. I can see clearly that my life has been restrained by pride and a regard to my reputation and not from any regard to God or his law or gospel. I can see that God has made use of my pride and ambition to restrain me from disgraceful inequities. I have been petted and flattered, and I stood upon my dignity, and have maintained my reputation from purely selfish motives. She thus acknowledged her fashionable, worldly wickedness, bowed to Jesus, and became a meek and humble follower of Christ. She afterward married a very wealthy man in New York City, but kept true to God. Boston, 1832. While Finney was laboring in Providence, the Boston ministers sent Dr. Wisner, pastor of the Old South Church, as a spy to watch the work in Providence and report. It led to Finney's being invited to Boston. Dr. Lyman Beecher was pastor of Bowdoin Street Congregational Church. He was the man who, only five years before, threatened to fight Finney all over New England. His talented son, Edward Beecher, was pastor at Park Street Church. Fifty-seven years afterward, November 6, 1889, he wrote, I was pastor of the Park Street Church when Finney was first invited to preach in Boston, and I invited him to preach for me. He complied with my request and preached the most impressive and powerful sermon I ever heard. No one can form any conception of the power of his appeal. It rings in my ears even to this day. It met good results in all who heard him and have ever honored and loved him as one as truly commissioned by God to declare his will, as were Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Paul. I stop in the story to copy this opinion of Finney's preaching because Edward Beecher's father, Dr. Lyman Beecher, was one of the most famous and powerful preachers of his day. Edward Beecher's younger brother, Henry Ward Beecher, filled the world with his fame as one of the mightiest preachers of the century. Yet Dr. Edward Beecher, who had heard his illustrious father and his immortal brother preach a multitude of times, was personally acquainted with all the other great preachers of his age, says of Finney's sermon, it was the most impressive and powerful sermon I ever heard. This confirms my judgment of Finney's preaching, that for matchless power to sway men for good, he was easily the greatest preacher I ever heard, I think the greatest of the century.
It was this year that somebody invited Finney over from Boston to preach three days at Andover, the seat of Andover Theological Seminary. It chanced to be the time of the graduating exercises of the seminary. Forty-two orations had been prepared by the young men. Half of them that conflicted with Finney's preaching services had to be given up. Reverend Justin Edwards, D.D., then a favorite preacher in New England, on one evening was to preach a sermon before the alumni of the seminary. There was a decided opposition to Mr. Finney among the professors and students of the seminary, says Professor Park, the most famous professor the seminary ever had. He thus describes the occasion in the preaching of Finney. Such was the fame of Mr. Finney that we were compelled to give up our exercises. Only thirty people gathered to hear the discourse of Dr. Edwards, and they adjourned. There were between two and three hundred preachers and students for the ministry in the audience. Mr. Finney's discourse was one which could never be printed and could not easily be forgotten. The eloquence of it could not be appreciated by those who did not hear it. The text was 1 Timothy 2, 5, One Mediator Between God and Men, the Man Christ Jesus. His sermon was just one hundred minutes long. It held the unremitting attention of his hearers, even of those who had opposed his interference with our seminary exercises. It abounded with sterling argument and startling transitions. It was too earnest to be called theatrical, but in the same sense of the word it was called dramatic. Some of his rhetorical utterances were indescribable. I will allude to one of them, but I know that my allusion to it will give no adequate idea of it. He was illustrating the folly of men who expect to be saved on the ground of justice, who think that they may perhaps be punished after death, but when they have endured all the penalty of which they deserve, they will be admitted into heaven. He was appealing to the uniform testimony of the Bible, that the men who are saved at all are saved by grace. They are pardoned. Their heaven consists in glorifying the vicarious atonement by which their sins were washed away. He was describing the jar which the songs of the saints would receive if any intruder should claim that he had already endured the penalty of the divine law. The tones of the preacher then became sweet and musical as he repeated the words of the ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a great voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. No sooner had he uttered the word blessing than he started back, turned his face from the mass of the audience before him, fixed his glaring eyes upon the gallery at his right hand, and gave all the signs of a man who was frightened by a sudden interruption of the divine worship. With a stentorian voice he cried out, What is that I see? What means that rabble rout of men coming up here? Hark, hark, hear them shout. Hear their words. Thanks to hellfire we have served out our time. Thanks, thanks, we have served out our time. Thanks to heaven. Then the preacher turned his face from the side gallery, looked again at the mass of the audience, and, after a lengthened pause, during which a fearful stillness pervaded the house, he said in gentle tones, Is this the spirit of the saints? Is this the music of the upper world? And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all things that are in them, heard I saying, Unto him that sitteth on the throne, and unto the Lamb be the blessing, and the dominion, in the honor and the glory for ever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. During this dramatic scene, five or six men were sitting on a board which had been extemporaneously brought into the aisle and extended from one chair to another. I was sitting with them. The board actually shook beneath us. Every one of the men was trembling with excitement. The power of the whole sermon was compressed into that vehement utterance. It is more than fifty-eight years since I listened to that discourse. I remember it well. I can recall the impression of it as distinctly as I could a half-century ago. 
But if every word of it were on the printed page, it would not be the identical sermon of the living preacher. Referencing writes Charles G. Finney, pages 71 to 74. This was a terrific blow at the doctrine of universalism, as Finney found it, which then saturated New England thought and life and still curses it. No wonder that under such preaching universalists were driven from their refuges of lies and bowed to Jesus, or else fled from the preacher's presence in dismay to rave at and slander Finney. Such a preacher at last was in Boston, perhaps it never heard a greater. Whitefield is probably the only one who can be compared with him for pulpit power. And here is his comment on the work. I began by preaching around in the different churches on the Sabbath, and on week evenings I preached at Park Street. I soon saw that the Word of God was taking effect, and that the interest was increasing from day to day. But I perceived also that there needed to be a great searching among professed Christians. I could not learn that there was among them anything like the spirit of prayer that had prevailed in the revivals at the West and in New York City. There seemed to be a peculiar type of religion there, not exhibiting that freedom and strength of faith which I had been in the habit of seeing in New York. I therefore began preaching some searching sermons to Christians. But I soon found that these sermons were not at all palatable to the Christians of Boston. This was new to me. I had never before seen professed Christians shrink back as they did at that time in Boston from searching sermons. But I heard again and again of speeches like these. What will the Unitarians say if such things are true of us who are Orthodox? If Mr. Finney preaches to us in this way, the Unitarians will triumph over us and say that at least the Orthodox are no better Christians than Unitarians. It was evident that they somewhat resented my plain dealing, and that my searching sermons astonished and even offended very many of them. However, as the work went forward, this state of things changed greatly, and after a few weeks they would listen to searching preaching and came to appreciate it. We had a blessed work of grace, and a large number of persons were converted in different parts of the city. It is evident, however, that Finney's preaching at this time, or at any of the four subsequent revivals in Boston, did not result in any such general movement as in some other places. At all of his five revival efforts in Boston, extensive revivals attended his ministry, and it is a universal testimony of the members of the Park Street Church surviving from that time that the conversions were characterized by greater permanence than those brought about in connection with the labors of any other revivalists whom they've had with them. Referencing Wright's Finney, page 106. Finney, with his subtle discernment, detected that the type of religion in Boston was peculiar. It had been so for a century. The keen, intensely active, subtle intellect of the heart of New England must be matched by a correspondingly deep spirituality to be kept in true lines of thought and healthy religious life. If it is not, the Yankee intellect goes off, not into business and money-making only, but also into speculation and philosophy and theology. Under the excessive Calvinism of a century ago, religion ebbed. Then there was a reaction, and Unitarianism and Universalism swept in like a flood. Boston and its vicinity have been the natural home and exploiting ground of every fad and fanaticism and species of infidelity ever since. Millerism, Spiritualism, Tom Paineism, Christian Scientism, Swedenborgianism, Unitarianism, Universalism, Free Thoughtism, Free Loveism, Agnosticism, Skepticism are all enthroned there, and all are flourishing. A doctor of divinity, a son of Massachusetts, once said to me, You cannot name an ism that has cursed American thought and life that did not have its birth or home within fifty miles of Boston. All the advocates and adherents of this swarm of isms have associated together and intermarried. The religious teacher's lips are now sealed. He must not preach the mighty gospel of Jesus Christ in all its fullness 
for if he should, he will be reflecting on Deacon A's Unitarian son-in-law, or Deacon B's Universalist daughter-in-law, or Deacon C's spiritualist sister, or rich Mr. D's cousins or uncles or aunts, who are all Christian scientists. They are all such nice people, and stand so well in Boston society, it must be that they are highly pleasing to God. Whoever was born in Boston was so well born that he does not need to be born again. Especially a diploma from Harvard or the Boston Tech or Wellesley is a sure passport to heaven. It has therefore come about that there has been developed in the intellectual capital of New England a self-satisfied, self-complacent, self-admiring, broad-gauge, free-thinking, go-as-you-please, believe-what-you-will, we are all going to heaven together type of religion that Finney thought was peculiar. It did not want to be searched and probed until professors of religion got down to the core and marrow of spiritual things and struck the rock for the foundation of their spiritual hopes. Nothing can save Boston thinking from skepticism and her piety from the dry rot of indifference, but a mighty baptism with the Holy Spirit for righteousness and true holiness. Subtext. For Beecher's and Finney's opinions of Boston, see last part of chapter 12. <laughs>